this is a special YouTube segment about cardiac health. I have two cardiologists with me. They are Dr. Dr. Valamkanda. I am an assistant professor at, uh, at Yale in the, in the Department of Cardiology, and I special, specialize in heart failure. Okay, and Dr. Dr. Jamie Gerber. I'm a cardiologist at Yale School of Medicine, specializing in preventive cardiology. Now, we did a full program earlier about a range of cardiac issues and how to um, maintain health and preserve the health of our heart. Now we want to talk about the role of family history, because this YouTube section will go to people throughout the this, this state. Anybody wherever they are and have access to YouTube will be able to, to see it. So I want you to talk to people about the role of family history in cardiac health and what they can do to mitigate when there's a negative history and how they should go about it. So the floor is yours. So um, in cardiology, like in, in many other conditions, um, family history is, is very relevant, and, um, and it, to a certain extent, depends on what heart condition we're talking about. Um, in, 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 when we talk about premature coronary artery disease, meaning having a heart attack at a very early age, family history becomes very important, much more relevant in women again. But and if you have a family member, um, men less than 55 or women less than 65, um, having a heart attack, and that becomes a very relevant history, and taking a good history is important. Um, and there are other heart conditions, what we call cardiomyopathies, where the heart gets thick or weak um, prematurely. And in those conditions also, um, uh, family history makes a very, very big, uh, big impact in, in assessing the risk of the patient and also managing them. How can we prevent heart failure in people who have a negative family history? Um, when patients come in with cardiomyopathies or have a weak heart um, and have a family history of, uh, of uh, cardiomyopathy and a weak heart, um, one would be on a high alert. You would screen the, uh, screen the patients to make sure that they are not developing the same condition that their first-degree relatives probably have. Um, and that, that might include frequent doctor visits, might include an EKG, an ultrasound of the heart called echocardiogram. And... And if the diagnosis is made early, then the treatments can be uh, implemented sooner. Um, but also, again, following a life, uh, lifestyle that's heart healthy is, is important and, and, um, in, in all, all walks of life, especially in cardiac care. So following, um, re exercising regularly, following a low-salt diet, avoiding um, high fatty foods, uh, and maintaining an ideal body weight would be very helpful. Thank you. Dr. Gerber, you are very big on prevention. I know that from years ago, having spoken to you, you are very big on prevention. So I'm going to give you patient A. Patient A comes to you. She is 55 years old. She, her mother had died at age 52 from a massive coronary. Her father has had a number of surgery, yes, stents and all these things. And she has swollen ankles. She's feeling tired, and she comes to you and she says, I don't know what's going on. I think I'm doing everything right, but something is wrong. How are you going to fix her? What are you going to do for so her? We're, we're, going to, we're going to fix her. So there, that patient needs a lot of attention. The family history there is very striking. And as we heard from Dr. Bellum Conda, the impact of father, mother, sister, brother, before age 55 having any sort of heart problem is very dramatic and impacts that person very significantly. So we want to start by taking a careful history of not just the family, but what's happening in that person's life and health, and then by doing a very careful exam, which will lead us to additional tests, EKG, blood work, echocardiogram. So a person like that needs extra careful attention to the development of heart disease of all types, whether it's blocked arteries or weakened heart, um, and when they first show up for a visit. What do you tell her that when she leaves your office, what are the top three things she needs to either change about her life or start doing you know, in, if she weren't doing these things before? Well, the number one is always stop smoking. 
All right, so we know we have to stop smoking. We can't change our genes, but we might be able to find out a little bit more about them. We need to control our blood pressure on our diabetes and engage in a healthy lifestyle, which means getting some regular exercise three times a week and trying to be on a lower fat diet. And walking briskly. So that exercise might be walking briskly at least three times a week, try to walk for three miles. Now, if somebody has not been exercising at all, three miles might be a big order, might be a tall order. Would it be okay to start walking, say, for half an hour at first and... Sure. Start, start, start small. Take baby steps, five minutes at a time. Go to 15 minutes at a time. Increase to 30 minutes at a time. And when a person can sustain 30 minutes of exercise without any undue uh, limitation or symptoms or shortness of breath, then you can maybe go a little faster. But you can always build up. Start slow and take baby steps. My last question for the both of you. What about coffee? Um, many of us need a cup of coffee to get us going. Um, <laughs> If you are having swollen joints, small in ankle and all this, is it okay to drink coffee? So the ill effects of coffee have been um, shown when you drink excess of coffee. And so excess means? Excess is defined as more than six cups of coffee oh. a day. So most people don't drink that much. Okay. Um, and we do ask patients to cut down on the coffee intake if they're having palpitations. But other than that, um, one or two cups of coffee a day has not much, much of an Ill, Ill effect on their health. I, I do have one more question. If you have an arrhythmia, if your heart beats irregularly, is it okay to drink coffee? I think that's the one situation where coffee intake needs to be moderated because certain arrhythmias are made worse by coffee. And usually the patient can tell me whether the coffee is making a difference. And stopping caffeine and remembering that caffeine is in Coca-Cola and all other diet, all other colas, um, uh, in many other uh, soft drinks as well, as well as uh, hot chocolate. And, uh, oh, and, really? Hot yeah, chocolate has in caffeine? Yeah, and, and chocolate has a significant amount of caffeine. And uh, there are a number of the energy drinks which uh, you know, people are, you know, like to take to stay up and can cause arrhythmias. So if, there's an, if there are palpitations, you should give up all forms of caffeine. Thank you very much. I hope you will find this helpful. And if you have a negative family history for heart disease, please go and get a good primary care physician who can help to coordinate your care and find you a good cardiologist to help to keep you healthy and reduce the likelihood of having a heart attack. Good night, everyone.